Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC DLC Drop Drop Podcast. Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the DLC Drop Podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Josh Otero, CEO and co-founder of NutriGamer and well-being expert. Welcome to the podcast, Josh. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, it's been great getting to know you. You and I have have gotten to know each other through the Esports Trade Association. Um, We've been at a number of events. Uh, You've been gracious to be a sponsor there. And, you know, I I feel like I've really gravitated towards you getting to know you as a person and also getting to know a little bit about your journey and what you're about to launch uh, to the gaming world, which I'm really excited to, to see happen. So why don't you take us back to the very beginning of this journey. Right now, you're a CEO, you're a co-founder of this great product that's about to launch. How did this journey start? Well, I mean, it started a long time ago. I mean, I I spent uh, about 15 year career in finance and financial services, but I had always had a passion for health and well-being and, and really that peak performance. And in my former life as a, you know, putting on a suit every day, I would go in and, and, and talk to the financial people and investors. And a lot of times we would end up talking about health and wellness or lifting or something that, you know, was my passion. And I was always asked if I could talk to groups of, of investors or uh, financial people about health and well-being. And, I loved it. That was the highlight of my day when somebody would ask me to get in front of 50 or hundred people and talk about how to live a high performance lifestyle or do something like that. And it was, it was getting to a point where I was done putting on a suit and tie every day and ready to do something different and really looking for an alternative. And I'd been doing CrossFit and I had an opportunity to open up my own gym. And so I, I, myself and a partner decided to, to kind of open up a gym and we did that and loved it, but I wanted to do really a scalable business. And that wasn't really a scalable business. You know, it's a gym, it's fun, great. Um, but it's not a scalable business. So I I stopped doing that, started another company with my current co-founder, Dr. Holden McRae, Um, We started a company, actually, it was a performance company that focused on the recovery of athletes. And we did that by measuring HRV, which is heart rate variability. So it measures your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. And then kind of between the two, we could tell you if you're doing well, if you're not doing well, and then we could give you intervention. So we did that for a couple of years and this was right when Whoop came out and, you know, back in 2015, um, Whoop got a bunch of funding from LeBron James and yep. in, in not so many words, put us out of business. Um, we were oh, wow. with Polar and the chest strap and everybody was going to a wrist-based wearable and it was going to cost us a, a substantial amount of money to kind of pivot. So um, we, we ended up just closing that down and that, kind of led me to where I'm at now because that opened up other doors for us. And my co-founder ended up calling me a couple of years, about almost three years ago now, and, and letting me know about this opportunity that he saw in esports and gaming. And so I, I could continue that, or if you want to kind of dive deeper into any area that we talked about. Yeah, no, I love, I love talking about that origin story there. Um, so take me back um, to the beginning when you were, uh, in finance, because I, I know you got your degree in finance, and then you continued with a finance career, and that's pretty standard, I, especially with guys who have a business interest. I know a lot of friends who they said, "Yeah, I, I got a finance background just for my personal well-being. So no matter what I did in life, I'd know how to manage my own finances." Well, I, I think what's so interesting is how you had those moments, and I can relate to that, where you have those moments where you're asked to speak on something you're passionate about or do something that it just feels like you're a fish swimming downstream. Like I was meant to do this. I was born for this. 
when first question is when did you get into fitness? Was this as a teenager? Was this in college? When did that start for you? Oh no, it started when I was 18 months old and my mom put me in gymnastics. Oh wow. Uh-huh. So I was, I started that journey along. I mean, when I was barely walking that I started that health and, and, and fitness journey. So that's, I mean, I started that at 18 months old and really never looked back. Wow. Yeah. I, I was, a I was always an athlete and then I got into skateboarding, uh, you know, early teens, but I, I was always in shape, but I never lifted, you know, I never really worked out. And so it wasn't until, uh, let's see, s- senior year of my college career, uh, when Sacramento state, they built a wellness center and it was f- quote unquote free because it was taken out of our tuition. And so I was like, wow, it's not going to cost me anything. I'm always in pretty good health, but what if I actually started lifting? You know, what what could my health be like then, and what could my physique be like then? Um, so I I always think it's interesting to hear when somebody got that bug, but it sounds like with you, you were born with it. Yeah, and I you know I did gymnastics all growing up, and I quit. I got into a little rebellious age from like you know in junior high school, which in Chicago it's sixth through eighth grade. So I actually stopped gymnastics and during that, you know, my junior high years, and then I started it again back in in high school. And then I continued that through college. So I actually took a little hiatus from uh, gymnastics and in junior high, but I did a lot of other things that I was very active, um, but not in competitive sports in that, you know, that three year time frame, and then got back into it in high school just because I had a love for it. And I found that, my coaches really helped guide me and Mm. without my coaches, I wouldn't be where I'm at now because I was going the wrong way and they kind of steered me back to the right way. That's awesome. So when you were in finance, so you get your degree and then you start your career in finance, were you hoping that, Oh, maybe sometime I can get into, uh, into health and wellness or were you kind of looking to uh, earn enough experience to get into an opportunity? Or were you just saying, hey, maybe health and wellness is a hobby and I'm going to do this career that I'm not super passionate about and just kind of organically the opportunities arose? It's a good question. So actually, you know, at at that time I was 22, 23. I was really, you know, looking to make money. I mean, that, that was my main goal. So I, I, I really wasn't looking for a career in health and wellness or fitness or anything like that, or, you know, any, all I was looking to do is to make money. And I was, I started lifting, 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 you know, after I graduated college, because, you know, during college, you know, we would work out four hours a day, but it was more on the equipment and body weight stuff. And then, you know, maybe an hour in the morning at the gym pre off season to kind of gain a little bit of muscle. But after I graduated, that's when I actually started like lifting weights on a heavier basis. Um, and then, you know, that was my passion. That was, I, I love doing it. I love learning about it, but I never thought that that would become a career or somewhere that I wanted to go. I was all I, all I wanted to do is make money so then I yeah. could do what I wanted to do. I wasn't thinking about anything else which, you know, looking back, you know, I miss out on some things, but it was all, it led me to the right place, right? I'm, I'm exactly where I need to be. So it all led me to the right place, but it, it wasn't, I was very myopically focused on dollars, not anything else, which, you know, as, as you know, a 45 year old adult now, I realized there's a lot more to life than just making money. Sure. So, but at 22, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. We can find ourselves in all sorts of different places just based on just being available for opportunity. I look at myself and some of the ways, the way my career has gone, I I never, you know, if you'd said 10 years ago, are you going to be in the esports industry? I would have thought you were crazy. And so I, I think that's cool when, and that's a lesson for our audience as well, I think is just, you don't have to have it all planned out. You just have to go and be available and have an eye out for opportunity. And I think, I think there's also an ability to evaluate or see real opportunity because you don't want to go after bad opportunities. You're going to find yourself in a, in a poor situation if you do. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's trust in the process. 
one of the things that I learned later on is you got to trust the process and it's about the journey. It's not about the destination. You know, in my mind, when I started out, it's about how much money can I make? You know, when can I get to $5 million? I want, you know, I'm $5 million. That was all I cared about. And really, you know, looking back, you missed the whole journey because if you're only focused on the destination, this journey that is actual life, that's your life. Cause there's never an end destination until you're dead. So, right. you know, being myopically focused on one thing was you're missing out on all this other stuff that's going on. And it took me a few years to be able to put that all together and to realize that. That's a great lesson. I, I learned the same thing myself was um, I was on a skateboard tour for six months straight. And so, and this was a long time ago, I think it was uh, 22 years old, 21, 22. And I went on this journey and I thought, man, I think I found what I want to do. I think I'm going to do this for 10 years. And it was six months, I broke my ankle and I was never part of that organization ever again after that. And what that taught me was wherever you are, you, you don't know how long you're going to be there. You know, and um, this was true with PRG as well. I was with PRG for about six months right before the pandemic. I'm traveling everywhere, uh, going to all these cool events and having some really cool experiences. I'm so thankful I had the foresight to soak it all in, you know, to say, because I, I was thinking maybe this will last two years, maybe the last three years. I didn't know a pandemic was coming in six months. And um, I feel thankful to have learned that lesson at a young age. But I think that's a real great lesson, especially for young people, is a- appreciate every moment, even if you're young, because, man, this could be over tomorrow or it could last for 20 years. You don't know, but, you know, you don't want to take it for granted. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's, if you're not really enjoying the process and the journey, you're missing out on 90 percent of everything. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit more about the um, the experience of owning a gym. I can, I don't know anything about that. Um, I do know in the skateboarding world, skate shops don't make any money. And so, you know, before I got into esports, people would say, John, you're this business guy who skates. Are you going to open your own skate shop? And I'd say, no, I can't afford to lose money opening a skate shop. Um, so I'm curious, what are some of the, I don't know, the pros and cons of the, the gym world? So... Well, my, my vision of my, the gym that I opened was to build a community of, of like-minded people. You know, I'm a community guy. So like that's, we're doing that now. We're trying to, you know, we're working on building a community, but my goal with the gym was really to build a, a close knit community because it's not like a traditional gym where you go in, you don't know anybody and you leave. It was a CrossFit gym. So it was, we'd go out for happy hour every Friday. We'd have wine and, you know, we do different things where, you know, we would go out and drink and just have fun and work out hard and and then compete and, and do things together. So my goal was to, you know, eventually to open up multiple gyms and to build that, that scale that community to other areas and places. Um, and Abby, it never worked out like that. You know, the, the, from what you learned before you actually did that, it took me learning and not, you know, being as successful as I thought I could build the, you know, I thought looking at traditional gym and revenue, I could scale this gym to X amount of revenue, realizing once I was going that it was capped at a certain amount based on the class size and, you know, everything. And I couldn't really scale to I wanted where we wanted to. And we were actually looking one of the things that I did have the foresight to do is to look to partner with a company that was working on um, Native American reservations and building a health and wellness program for them. So that's one thing I did, you know, foresee and, and kind of went into. Unfortunately, the the, the the reservations ended up losing a bunch of money. It was a casino thing. And so our whole contract with that kind of flew out the window. Um, but I did, you know, I spent nine months building that up and then it kind of, it it went away, it blew up. And while I was working on that, our gym membership was kind of declining because I was spending all my time on that. So there's a lot of lessons I learned with the gym and really building the gym and kind of what my expectations were versus what reality was and kind of how maybe I could have done it differently. I'm glad I didn't because I learned a lot and it led me to other opportunities but I failed a lot. I mean, 
you know, spending nine months to do something and then it just blows up. You know, I was focused 40 hours a week on doing something and then it turned to absolute zero. Um, but I learned, you know, and it was a good experience. And so I, I can't, I wouldn't change it if I could. Wow. Uh, you know, what, what's so I've been, eye opening to me, you know, experience is the best teacher, right? Life is the best teacher. And what I love about a big unlock for me was when I realized in business, okay, if I try something and I fail, it's not a zero sum game. I don't just go back to where I was before I tried or, or back further than before I tried now financially, maybe, right. It depends on how much money was, was in the, uh, invested or you lost or whatever, but put yourself in front of new people, new opportunities. You learn so much. You're a different person, new skills when you come out of that. How was that? Number two questions. One is, what did you learn from that experience? But what I'd like to hear first is, what did that do to you personally, mentally, emotionally, trying something that fell apart? Were you still encouraged or was that something that was kind of hard for you to get over? Um, well, what I learned from it is really, I, when I go into situations, I have to go in with a better understanding of what I'm going into and and understanding of the team that I'm going in there with, you know, I think, you know, in, in the past I've jumped in, I'm a very A type aggressive person, very competitive person. So I, Sometimes, you know, there's, there's those people that think a lot and then there's people that do, but sometimes they shouldn't do, they should think first. <laughs> yes. I'm, the, I'm in that category. I'll do and then think later instead yes. of think about it and then do. I'm the guy that say something and I'll just do it. Like I don't, it's, I, I just go for it. So, and I still am. I, 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 that's just my personality. I'm very intent, you know, I'm, I'm sure. But you know, now at least I try to open my eyes a little bit more and, and do a little bit more. What am I getting into that? You know, so for example, getting into building Nutri Gamer, I spent a year and a half doing research before I even did anything. Um, spent, you know, just to understand every the opportunity better. But, you know, the, the lessons I took away from the, the gym experience and, and not being successful is, if I, if you don't try, you don't know. So I do it again. Cause you know, True. I, I'm, I, I've, I've learned you have to try in order to know if you could succeed. And if you don't try, you can never succeed. Right. If you're not willing to take risks, I'm a risk taker, obviously. Um, yeah. and I've lost, but I've also gained I won. And I, I, you know, I wouldn't be here where I'm at if I wouldn't have been willing to take high risks with my life and, and what I'm doing. So I believe, you know, learning how to take risks, but maybe a little bit more calculated risk, um, sure. you know, learning to persevere and, you know, how did I feel after the, the end? I felt like I screwed up and I was a little hard on myself initially. And then once I was able to reflect, you know, I did a lot of mindfulness and, and meditation and, and really was able to journal and reflect on what I had done. And it took me a little while, but I realized what I did and, you know, what I learned from it. And I just, instead of feeling sorry for myself or feeling negative, I said, all right, what, what lessons can I take from this experience? And then how can I move forward? And that's what I did. And then I started to, you know, recover faster shortly after that with the experience. And I did it a lot different than I did with the gym. So mm -hmm. I, I took what I learned and I, I built on that. Yeah, I've heard it said, if you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself, right? If you're never failing, you don't know where your, where your edge is, you know, how far you can go. Um, talk a little bit more about for our audience, what you, what you did to, you said, you know, I, I, I did some journaling, some meditation. I was, you know, I over, you know, to, to get back on top and, and pursue it again share some things that were successful for you to overcome that disappointment and get you back in a place where you said, okay, now I'm ready to, to charge it again and go, go for the next thing that I hope I succeed at, but could also be another failure as well. So, you know, I did a lot of, you know, if, when you look at like the emotional intelligence and, and kind of that route, I, I kind of looked inside and, and said, okay, how am I feeling? 
And what am I doing with myself to improve the way I feel from my internal and what I'm doing? Meaning I started, you know, I, I had, I started training more variety because I had stopped doing CrossFit, but I was doing more lifting. So I just started to improve my training a little bit. Um, I, I started journaling and just writing, you know, just every night, just what am I grateful for? You, you know, like three things I'm grateful for. Um, and I still do that. Um, yeah. and then, you know, what, what am I, what am I feeling? You know, or what do I, what am I going through? What emotions am I going through? And then just writing that out, getting that on paper, it seemed like, and that was something I learned. I, I read, um, Dr. Susan's David, uh, David's book, emotional agility right around that time. And it, it helped me get dip, my, change my perspective on everything. And then I, I, I downloaded the headspace app and started using the headspace app. Um, and then really just started focusing on myself. Cause I realized it was some things that I was not doing for myself that I should have been. And so I really just dove in inside so then I could get better on the outside. Yeah. You know, it seems like younger people are more comfortable with mental health, health, just dis discussing it, you know, previous generations, if you were going to a counselor, you're talking about journaling. If you're a guy, maybe, you know, people make fun of you, look down on you. Um, I've really learned very recently about the vast benefits of just taking care of yourself as a person and then how you're then ready for business or, or, or success. Because so many times, it, maybe it's not your business plan, your business model, your idea that's holding you back, but you can have thoughts of uh, self-sabotage or I can't do this or is anybody really going to believe me or is anybody going to hire me? It's so important that we take care of ourselves first and then, then we're ready to attack uh, the business side. Yeah, we impose these self-limiting beliefs in ourselves, and then we kind of limit our potential because we don't believe that we can get there. And that's something that I removed and, you know, exponentially so I could get to wherever I want to go. But I think a lot of people do that. And yeah, I mean, my generation, like I said, I'm 45, you know, meditation and mindfulness was not really something that was talked about or really, you know, it was a, it was a sign of weakness. And I, I always thought right. it was a sign of weakness too. And I'm the tough guy that wants to be, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to be, you know, admit any weakness. And so I had to learn to step back and say, okay, you're not weak. If you admit that you don't know something or that you're, you want to learn and build yourself or that you have emotions that are not always positive. And so being able to grapple with those emotions, understand those emotions, and then, you know, do things that traditionally, that macho guy doesn't do is, is important. And now, like you said, the generation, you know, the, the millennials and the Gen Zers, especially the Gen Zers, I think mindfulness and, and it's more open, it's more accepted and mental health is obviously a, a, a bigger focus. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a couple things that, um, that helped you get over that. Was there somebody who opened your mind to that or how did you discover that since, you weren't naturally the type of person that, that would go there uh, from a mental perspective. So I started listening to podcasts and um, I listened to podcasts, um, the model health show by Sean Stevenson. And then he had um, Dr. Susan David on, and then I got her book. So then once I, you know, I, in 2015, I think it was, I started, that's when I started really getting into podcasts and things like that. So that's really what changed my perspective on, I mean, it was 2014, 2014, 2015, whatever it was, that's when I really started to, to listen to podcasts and really understand how big mental health was and emotional health and emotional agility was. And then, you know, you know, I read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl and really got a lot out of that. And so that's when I really, because up until that point, I've always focused on peak performance from a physical and health side, but never, not as much from a mental and emotional yeah. side that changed me and to focus more on the emotional and mental health side. And it took me like two years really to get to, I think 
took me two years really of focusing on that to really understand it better. That's interesting. I think this year with COVID and these these teams in the bubble, for me, has has opened my mind the most to the importance of mental strength. Uh, when you look at, I, I think a big reason why the Los Angeles Lakers won the NBA championship this year was you had LeBron was that leader, you know, and he kept his team focused. And you had, boy, these people couldn't see their families. They couldn't see their kids. I mean, it's a tough thing. And then last night I was I was watching the uh, the college national championship and Alabama won. Um, and Nick Saban's talking all about how this was such a disciplined group of people and how much it took in this time that it's so interesting just to see the unseen or become aware of the unseen strengths on top of the physical strengths and talents that enable you to succeed. I think Nick Saban and LeBron James have both been into what, what I'm talking about for some time. Like I said, LeBron James invested into whoop six years ago. Right. So he was, yeah. he was on the forefront when I started it. Um, so I know, you know, he's been in it. I know uh, Nick Saban's been in it for a while. So these you know, these top performers are seeing what, it, you know, I didn't realize until, you know, six years ago. Um, and they've been top performers for a long time because it's not just the fitness and the health, it's, it's the overall being as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So take me now. So you're in this gym health fitness world. How did you, and now you're in the, the esports world about to I'll launch this amazing product. Tell me how you got from there to, uh, where you're at today with, you know, how did esports come on your radar, this industry? Take me through that. So about three years ago, it may have been three and a half years ago now, my co-founder at the company that I had told you about, um, Recover Faster, he was a professor at Pepperdine. Hmm. So about three and a half years ago, he got tasked with starting the high performance program for the number one esports team in the world. And while he was putting that high performance program together, he noticed that these athletes, they were sponsored by an energy drink, but yet they were pouring the energy drink out and putting water in it and drinking that energy drink on film because they noticed they're drinking two or three of these a day. It was affecting yeah. their performance in a negative way. So they said, Hey doc, what do we do? You know, what should we be drinking? We noticed if we're drinking this drink, it's, it's affecting us in a negative way but we have yeah. to drink the can because obviously we're paid to, but we can't drink the actual drink because it, it, it gives us that big spike and then crash. And it's just, we notice it affects our performance and we're trying to play at the elite level. So, you know, they have cooks, they have personal trainers, they have mindset coaches. So these, these guys have all these um, available resources, but yet they're drinking this garbage. So they were yeah. looking for something that was in line with this tier one, you know, player, um, mentality. And yeah. so he did some research and he couldn't find anything. So he calls me up and he says, Hey, Josh, I think you should start this company focused on esport and gamer health and nutrition, you know, starting with, you know, finding an energy alternative to the traditional energy drinks. Yeah. So I said, okay, I don't really know much about esports or gaming. I mean, I played it when I was growing up, but that was like 20 years ago. So I yeah. hadn't played Zelda or Mario brothers or, you know, street fighter, any of those for a long time. So I, I dove in and I spent, like I said, a year and a half plus really just understanding esports, uh, the gaming market, the demographics, really the business opportunity in the market. And I fell in love with it. You know, I, I really, I, I love what every, what every, what was going on, what they were building, and that there, I saw, I started to notice this trend towards wellness and health mm, yeah. in, in gaming and esports. you know, it was, and it was accentuated when COVID hit, but I had started, I had noticed it before and I'm like, absolutely. So that's kind of my journey, how we got into this. And then, um, we found a third uh, co-founder who is a consumer packaged goods guy. And the three of us came together and uh, created NutriGamer. That's incredible. I mean, it's it's kind of a, a perfect time, perfect place sort of a thing. I think what, you know, esports is is so mental. It's it's obviously less physical. It's it's the reaction uh speed 
uh, the, the reaction times is more the physical part of it. But there's so much that goes into it from, number one, a focus standpoint. There's the communication with your teammates and just the confidence, you know, look good, feel good. And in, in, in fact, I always tell shoe brands, I'm like, stop going for the performance aspect with esports. We know that nobody's playing any better because they're wearing your shoes. But if you're walking into that arena and you're wearing some J's, you know, or you're wearing some Yeezys, you feel good, like you're ready to take that stage because you know you look good. That's the vibe. And um, so it, I think it's so cool to really be able to reinforce and support gamers knowing that, even though historically that's been something that's kind of been overlooked. You know, a lot of in the, in the past, many energy drink companies and nutrition companies kind of t- took their already made products, not made for gaming, but just made for either life or traditional sports and they just dumped them energy, into the sports right? market. Just for energy. Yeah. Yeah. Just to get energy. And then great. You get a big spike and then you get a big dump. So you have to either drink a bunch during the day or you're going to be just, you know, you're going to be like a, a, you know, spiking and crashing all day long. So, you know, we wanted to be the first in the category to create something that was specifically designed for gamers in mind. Mm. And so what the way Holden designed the product is he designed it from the esport and the gaming perspective. So it's all cognitive folk, you know, base. So versus having all these other, you know, ingredients in our products that are, you know, for your vasodilators and stuff for lifting and all this stuff. Well, we're not lifting, we're playing video games. So it's it's not (laughs) pre-workout. It's not pre-workout. Yeah. It's not a pre-workout. You dump these pre-workouts and these kids, you know, you get a spot, you get all this crazy energy and then you get, you know, a big lull. So, you know, Holden went and we created something that provides, you know, gamers and esport athletes with sustained energy, focus and concentration specifically designed for them, not for Mm. anybody else for cognitive athletes, because that's what they are. They're cognitive athletes. So, and you know, we could take this to an engineer, a software developer, anybody, because they're all working with their brains and their minds and using them all day long. Yeah. And I know why we built this because we saw this huge market and this huge opportunity. And then, Oh, by the way, there's all these other, you know, off markets that have to do with, you know, gaming in one way or the other, whether it's technology or programming or, anything. And, and we're like, this is, this is needed. And this, we need something that's healthy and that people could drink, you know, on a daily basis and not have long-term side effects. Like you would, if you drink two or three, you know, energy drinks a day. Yeah. Something that I love about NutriGamer is that gamer first approach. You know, I, I think that it's, I talk about sponsorship all the time, as you know, with non-endemics and I talk all the time about the importance of looking at the community first and finding out what their needs are. And it's it's a little bit striking what a common uh, mistake that is across the board that people are, it's just, no, here's my thing. And just pushing it to people. Um, I had somebody on the podcast last week and she was talking about in tech, a, a lot of times what's happening is people are creating solutions and then searching for a problem. Instead of seeing the problem and serving the problem with a solution. And I just love, um, you know, I know you pretty well, and I, I know that you're a great person and community first person. It's just, it's just really inspiring to me to see that your company isn't just saying, what can we push to kids? <laughs> but you're saying, how can we make life better? And how can we do it uniquely for the community in the way that they need? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned before I'm community based and really trying to build that health and, and well being community. But yeah, we wanted to build something. We, you know, Holden saw this need. He called me up. I saw the need after doing a bunch of research in it. And I'm like, there's a huge need and there's a great market that would love to have something that would be, you know, healthy and a great alternative for them. And, and so, per, you know, creating a solution to this huge problem that is becoming bigger and bigger is, you know, I thought was for me, a no brainer, right? Cause I, I like to help people. And this is, we're going to help a lot of people because we get them off of this garbage, their lives are going to improve dramatically. And, yeah. you know, 
we, we could talk about the community aspect later and some of the things I believe on building a healthy community and that will do with gaming. But, you know, as far as bringing them healthy products, you know, you cut sugar out and you cut that fake, fake sugar out, you know, levels of diabetes are going to plummet. The levels of, you know, obesity are going to go down and it's just going to encourage a healthier lifestyle. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the community. I, I think um, what I would add to that is I'm always inspired by people who are making the active the act of gaming good for kids, healthy for kids. You know, it's, I always say it's easy to see the uh, negative aspects of gaming, which would be, okay, sedentary lifestyle, you're sitting down for a long time, you're getting a lot of screen time. Uh, we as parents, we know that, you know, you shouldn't be in front of a TV for hours or on your phone for hours. And so we just say, oh, no, let's get away from that. But there's a lot of benefits to gaming, and, and those things are less obvious. And I think, too, if we can make the act of it, what, what kids are consuming during gaming healthy for them as well, it's just going to, well, I think it's going to bring more people into the space. It's going to open more positive sentiment around it. And then, you know, it's going to create more opportunities for more kids as, you know, entertainment and technology is absolutely the future setting people up for, yeah, I, I do have this skill or I do have this, um, this ability because I have been playing video games for 15 years because my parents understood how to do it in a way that was beneficial for me, that set me up for success, not just, oh, get, get away from the computer. And of course, that's not an excuse not to have uh, time outside and um, time away from the console or the PC. But I just wanted to speak to that and, and thank you and uh, congratulate on you on that perspective as well. Talk a little bit about this um, community and, and what you're doing there. So, you know, I mentioned before, I'm a big community guy and I believe that community will help uh, a lot of problems, right? And, and one of the things that we noticed in, in the esports community is sometimes we have toxic chat rooms um, and you yeah. have people that are, maybe they're, they're playing League of Legends or they're playing, you know, something else, but they still feel a little isolated or lonely. So what we're, we've been doing is we were building our Discord server to really encourage gamers to come and be a part and to learn about health and wellness. So we're going to start posting stuff on sugar, why sugar is bad for you. We've got chiropractors in there, physical therapists, clinical psychologists. People could ask questions. We provide content. We're going to be really producing a lot more content here in the next upcoming months and on health and well-being and really how to create, you know, how to just build a healthier lifestyle. We believe by creating a healthier community, it's going to create a healthier generation of kids, which is less bullying, more confidence, more confidence equals taking the bullies out. You know, we don't allow any negativity in our discord. So if you're, if you're pushing anything negative, you'll be removed from our discord. Um, you know, we want to encourage people. We want to push people. We're going to be doing challenges and, and different things to kind of get the community involved. But, you know, community brings people together. It addresses mental health issues. It addresses, you know, toxicity. It addresses, you know, health from an overall and emotional well-being standpoint. So, I'm really focused on building a really large, healthy community in Discord. And, you know, we just started it. You know, we've got probably 80 some people in our Discord now, but I want to build it out and really grow it and have more people that are, you know, coaches. We have uh, personal trainers in there just having this great community. So when people join it and they have questions or like how to sit proper, how to set up their stations, you know, they have, we have the resources for them to do it. And, we keep them healthy and then we keep them confident. So then it eliminates the toxicity and the more confident they are, the more they're going to probably want to eat better, eliminate the sugar and the energy drinks and drink something that's healthier or eat, you know, healthier than the pizza or whatever. And, you know, yeah. become better people. I think that's great. You know, I mean, I, I think we can all agree right now uh, we could use less toxicity, <laughs> especially online. Right. And if we can teach kids um, the benefits of that and the dangers of that and, you know, that, that that's not, uh, you know, I, th I think one of the what they say about Twitter is like people are so aggressive and mean on Twitter because you can't get punched in the face. <laughs> like there's, there's no, no repercussions. You can do whatever you want and you can do. Yeah, that's why I like, 
Yeah, Twitter is it could be a great vehicle, but it also, you know, you say something the wrong way and you could get attacked and even though you didn't mean it. Right. It's just, it's not the healthiest where that's, you know, we want to just bring, you're still going to be on all these other channels, but if you could come to one channel where you feel safe and you, it's, it's really focused on health and well-being, we want to be that safe space that where you could come and, you know, it's not that we're not going to hold you accountable, but we're going to support you and push you. Yeah, you know, holding people accountable is often the the greatest thing you can do for them too, right? I mean, if you know, and especially with young kids, you you get away with doing the wrong thing for too long, you you, you become that person, or or you can you can get into stuff that that you shouldn't. Um, I also love just uh, you know your community being an example to others, because even if you know, there's so many communities, like you said, someone's going to be part of yours. They're also going to be part of somebody else's. But even if somebody isn't part of your community, what I love about what you're doing is setting that example to say, hey, this is how we're doing it. And I, I got to believe that the um, the results of that are going to be overwhelmingly positive. And so when people say, okay, wait, how can I make my community better? You know, nobody likes toxicity, right? So, you know, if you have that in your community, at some point, you're going to want to look at how to reduce that. Or somebody starting their own and they're looking around, who's doing it really well? Um, I think you're setting a great example for how that should be done. Can you share a few tips for people who are trying to build community on how this can be done successfully? Yeah. I mean, you, in, and I, like I said, I did this with the gym and we're doing this with discord. It, I, I like to, when people come in, have them welcomed and, and really make them feel part of something bigger than themselves. Right. So we're trying to create this big group, this big community that's bigger than any one person. And so when, when people are creating a community, making them feel welcome, making them feel like they're, they're appreciated. And when they're, they, post stuff and they do, they do different things on whatever their channel they're on. They, they they get recognition for it if it's positive and they don't, and they get, you know, consequences if it's not positive. And if, when they're encouraging other people, they're, in, they're getting encouraged themselves and they realize, Oh my gosh, this feels great. And I'm, you know, I'm working my butt off, but somebody's actually recognizing it. Right. So posting photos of like, body transformation or like working out or I stopped drinking, you know, four cokes a day. Now I'm only drinking one, like way to go. You know, you're really making progress. It's going to really help you. So having a community that really gets behind their, their, their community, you know, their, their people and, and supports them, I think is, is a big deal. And then just doing different events, you know, so like I said, we're going to be doing probably in the second quarter, some, some challenges and some fun, different things where we get people involved and whether it's a push up challenge an air squat challenge, or, you know, a burpee challenge, or, you know, we're going to do a one year body transformation challenge. It's, it's all community supported. So, yeah. and we're going to give prizes and have fun, but you know, it's, you can't go out and have drinks like a gym, but you can go out and have fun and chat on the Friday night and say, what are you guys doing? And so you could still, even though it's a virtual community, you could still engage and you could still have fun and you could still do different things. So it's, you know, you could do that with the in-person community or a virtual community. Yeah. I, I think what we've all learned during COVID is the importance of community. Um, I know one of the very sad aspects is um, the aspect of suicide. You know, there's been a lot of people who have who have died this year, not of COVID, but of um, of suicide, which is a terrible tragedy. And it it shows us that it's so important to get together, I think, in person. But also what what's dawned on me during this time is even the importance of virtual meetups, of virtual community Um at the Esports Trade Association, you know this because you're at all the virtual meetups. Um, it's shocking how many people we have showing up, literally hundreds of people who are registering to be introduced and to have community. And, you know, that's kind of more towards having business opportunities, which is important as well. But I've noticed, too, that, you know, during this time, well, pre-COVID, I didn't do a lot of video conference calls. I did a lot of phone conference calls. But it's just, it makes such a difference when you see someone's face and then creating those friendships that I've created over the last year where, you know, going on my entrepreneurial journey, you talk about community, 
you have people doing it with you, right? Somebody who you can relate to. You don't feel like you're doing it on your own. And with what you're doing, you have this very positive aspect of it for youth, you know, which, which I think is so important. So that's really exciting. Um, talk us a little bit through what you have planned. Uh, when is when is NutriGamer launching? Because I'm excited to get some of this for myself. So we're launching. We just changed this because we had a couple delays. Um, so now we're official. It's going to be April 1st. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to officially announce, you know, this is the first time publicly that we're going to be launching April 1st. So awesome. I'm very excited. Um, so we're, we're going to be working on some campaigns and some activation campaigns to really get, you know, the, the, everybody aware and get, you know, people signed up for our, all of our, everything that we're doing and get people to join our discord server. Um, one of the other things I'm excited to announce is we created a foundation called the warrior gamer foundation. And what that does is that pairs active duty and veterans with gamers to engage in meaningful and interactive play. That's cool. And they're with the focus on um, two things of mental health and mental health awareness and community building. Hmm. So we're, you know, there's 22 veterans a day that commit suicide. So, and it's because they're lonely and they're lost. And, and so we want to encourage community building through this foundation and also developing coping skills, social, emotional learning, leadership, mentorship, um, and, and ways that they could get involved in the community by educating gamers, by being inter- engaging with gamers and, and our youth to, you know, for them to understand what they've gone through. And then for the veterans and active duty to understand what the gamers are doing and it's a learning both ways. So that I'm really excited about to, to, you know, to be launching and we're going to start our tournament series probably next month um, with that. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And uh, we're, we've gotten some very good support and we've got clinical psychologists and cool. mental psychologists and sports coaches and sports psychs to really help us with that. Because that, again, that's a community build, but it's all about mental health. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I, I was actually on the phone the other day with the Frisco VFW, which is veterans of foreign wars. And, um, you know, they have these uh, chapters in, in all sorts of cities. And the woman was asking me, John, what is, you know, what is esports? What does gaming mean for our VFW chapter. And, you know, I'm not a veteran myself. I'm very thankful for everybody who has served our country. Um, but what I didn't know is typically mo- the the majority of veterans are pretty young nowadays, number one, and many of them are gamers. And so it's so cool how gaming, it can be esports or it can be non-competitive, but the fact that gaming, you know, you focus on community building here can be such a great source of community. And, you know, people might not think maybe a few years ago, oh, yeah, getting veterans together with community around video games. No, everybody's a gamer nowadays. And so to be able to use that tool um, to support people to bring the community so you're not isolated, so that you have somebody that you can relate to or can help you in a difficult time. That's really tremendous. Yeah, it's exciting. And it is everybody that's, you know, met many active duty, majority of active duty and, you know, younger veterans are gaming. So it's, it's kind of like a, it, it's almost a no brainer. And it's just yeah. using what they're already doing to actually create a sense of a community and to address some of the issues in social, emotional well-being and mental health. So just taking what they're already doing, everybody younger is gaming. Most yeah. of the veterans and active duty are gaming. So why not pair it together and then add this element of mental health. I mean, to me, it was a no brainer when I was putting it together. I'm like, it, it makes perfect sense. And I love to give back and I love to help. And, and so that's part of helping and giving back. Yeah. I think too, that's a lesson. What you said is that's a no brainer. Um, what's funny is I, I used to work with this guy a lot smarter than I am. And he used to always sell, say, John, nobody has your common sense. So the things that you think everybody else knows, they don't necessarily know. Things that are common sense to you are based on your experience and your viewpoint. Nobody has had your experience and your viewpoint. Um, I can tell you before this conversation, I probably wouldn't have put those things together. 
But I think that's another takeaway uh, for our audience um, to not take your own insights for granted, not to take your own, uh, you know, your your instincts or your common sense for granted. Um, share that with other people and uh, maybe you can create something that never has been created like what you're doing. When I, when I was on that journey, like I said, that self-transformation journey back in like 2015, that was one of the things I learned is like introspection and really being able to, sometimes you have these, you have these innate abilities that, you know, most people don't have, but if you don't ever take advantage of those or know what even they are, like, I didn't know what mine, like I, I, I had used them, but I didn't use them. Right. So I yeah. used them to create what I was building, but I didn't use them as my primary focus. Once I started shifting and th this is my primary focus, I built things. I'm, you know, this is what I do. Right. And I know I'm really good at it until I actually grasped that. And it took me those two years of really the, to transform myself into that, that, that bigger person. Then I, I realized it, but before that, you know, I was just going along and I didn't really realize it, but once you actually step back and really reflect you could, you could really do a lot of change and really seeing the skills that you have and what you're good at and actually identifying that and then leveraging that to game changer. Yeah. And I'd take that a, a step further and then saying, how can you help others with that? Right. Um, Which, yeah. Yeah. I had a good friend on the podcast not too long ago, Gabrielle Boucher, her whole company is the purpose factor, the it, helping people find their purpose. And what was a real unlock for me for that episode was your purpose can very often be what you've gone through yourself and helping others go through it since you're now an expert in that and you've experienced it yourself. Yep. It sounds like yeah. you've gone through a lot of community building and now you're in a fantastic place to help others join your community, but also I think build their own communities as well, it sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's that's the goal and really to guide and help people and to transform this, you know, what a lot of people are doing and to improve themselves and to, you know, better what their, their outlook, you know, if their yeah. outlook is better, they're going to be better people and they're going to treat themselves different, better. I love that. So before we go, why don't you tell us just a little bit more about the product so that when people, when it does come out April 1st, we're excited um, to help you promote that. Of course, um, first of all, what are the, what's, what are the SKUs? What, what does the product look like when it's going to release and where will people be able to get it? So, you know, Nutri Gamer. So our, our first product is our performance drink mix. So it's a powder drink mix. You just dump it in water and it's, like I said, it's science backed and clinically proven to improve focus, concentration and reaction time. Um, we, it comes in three flavors, organic watermelon, organic berry and organic sour gummy. So we'll sell those individually in 30 packs. And then we have a variety pack that has five, it's 15. So it's five of each flavor. So you cool. can taste and see which one you like the best. Um, we are selling online. So on our website, NutriGamer and it's gmr.com and we're, it's, it's up, but we're rebuilding it. We're adding a whole bunch to it. Um, and then the, we're going to be building out uh, additional products here later on in the year. We'll probably launch a, a second product in the summer and then another product in, uh, in the fall. So cool. we're working on a, a vision product and a kid's line. So I'll be excited to announce those as we get closer, but probably six months away from, uh, from doing that. But those are going to be game changers as well. And it takes into our philosophy of healthy and, you know, gamer cognitive focus. That's awesome. Well, I, I can't wait to try it myself. And for people who are watching that ep this episode, NutriGamer is N-U-T-R-I-G-M-R. And is it .com is your yeah. website? Yeah. Great. So we'll look for it up there. Um, thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. I, I was excited to talk about the product. I knew you a little bit personally, but I learned so much, not only about your story, um, but the value of community and how you're supporting others. So Thank you so much for joining us on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. 
Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.